Additionally, Kelly uh, was on the Tim Ferriss podcast I this week. I purposefully didn't listen after you told me because I was excited to get your raw take and then be able to speak back to you with zero knowledge. <laughs> um, we're in a day and age where uh, where everybody wants to hate on Kelly. Sure. You're leading the charge. I'll often jump in if I find there to be uh, something hypocritical that Kelly did. Kelly's a hateable man. I listened to this podcast. Liked him. Fell back in love. You're a Kelly Childhood, fan. Childhood, love, and maybe even lust with Kelly. Tell me, tell me, tell me about the things, the points. Well, in all of the ways that Peter Schroff cannot express himself in this podcast medium, Kelly can. Sure. And I think, um, so I think Kelly has made hip, is hypocritical in all the ways that we've discussed in the recent years, Aggressively right? Aggressively hypocritical, angrily hypocritical, lashing well, out at others for even daring to mention the hypocrisy, not willing to correct. go along with the joke, not even willing to accept that they're, okay, I get it. I get it. I, I live a do as I say, not as I do kind of life. And I think that that is reflective of human beings are complex and they make like, look, dealing with a certain amount of fame, talent, wealth, all comes with a lot of peril and you're going to make mistakes along the way. And so what I got out of this interview was him not directly fessing up to those mistakes, but really kind of confronting them in a lot of ways. And did he talk about being a father? Barely. See, that's the weird one for me. Well, it wasn't directly discussed. It wasn't directly asked of him, but family dynamic did come up and he did um, reveal probably more than he intended to about it. Talking about how he basically had unhealthy survival skills when he was growing up that he learned um, to kind of help buffer his mother from his father's alcoholism. And because Kelly had, Kelly was a middle child and because he had this talent that was very unique and a lot of attention because of it, um, he ended up becoming kind of this moderator or mediator in the family. And he realized later in life, and he's still kind of realizing now that I think actually he said that Shane Dorian said it about Jackson. Shane said, having a kid who has that much talent is sucks all the energy. Yeah. From the family into that. It takes a lot to maintenance that kid's sure. special gift. And so what ends up happening is the other siblings feel the vacuum. You know, they don't get the attention. And um, so Kelly's through Shane saying that Kelly kind of reflected on and he even then remembered one of his brothers. I think it was Sean um, saying you know, I wish that I would have pursued something other than surfing because there was just no way that I was ever going to compete with you. And I wish that I just kind of had, rather than being second or third fiddle, I'd wish that I just had my wow. own thing. And so Kelly, that kind of resonated with Kelly or he remembered him saying that from previously and it resonated because of what Shane said. And so Kelly, he said, as he was kind of working his way through all of these thoughts, he said, you know, I haven't even fully had these discussions with my family yet. So maybe I shouldn't be discussing it here publicly. Just that level of um, uh, confronting your own kind of things made me sympathetic towards Kelly. The Real quick for context. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea who Tim Ferriss is. Is he, is he a comedian? No. He's a what? Tim Ferriss is like a self-help dude. Okay. He's written a bunch of books, The 4-Hour Work Week, The 4-Hour okay. Body, okay. where his whole thing is about efficiency. And he actually, um, like he became, I don't know, the world champ tango dancer Just in Argentina in like three months. Okay. Like went down there. Um, I've learned how to maximize efficiency in all these other ways because I talked to all of these uh, peak performers, Tony Robbins, investors, whatever, Olympians, chess prodigies. So I'm going to apply all of those methods in learn tango. He went down and he learned surfing in Costa Rica. He, he brought Brad Gerlach down and as a coach and was going to learn surfing in two weeks. Does he surf well? No, but my buddy, Tony Roberts, photographer, Tony Roberts, um, 
was hired on as the guy to document all of it. And he said in two weeks, Tim got better at surfing than he's ever seen anybody in two weeks and arguably better than people get in two or three years. So like those methods tend to work for Tim. So anyways, he's written a bunch of books about it. Uh, Like I said, the four hour work week, you can be as efficient in four hours as most people are in 40 was the premise of the book. And um, so now he interviews whatever peak performers. That's kind of the purpose of the podcast. Okay. So he asks the exact same questions essentially to everybody, everybody, like I said, from Tony Robbins to Ray Dalio for investing. Are they they interesting questions? Yeah. Yeah. They're good. And interestingly, Kelly, it ends up revealing. I don't think he's that, to be honest, I don't think Tim Ferriss is that, um, attuned to the person. He's just kind of asking this formulaic thing, but it ends up getting out of the person a bunch of really interesting things. And I think that Kelly probably follows Tim and admires Tim. So Kelly's willing to kind of give him what he wants. Um, but that whole family dynamic thing, I really, again, I sympathized with Kelly because of it. Um, he talked about Andy Irons being the first competitor who ever like got in his face. Mm Mm-hmm. Basically, everybody just bowed down. Everybody, first of all, stepped aside for Kelly and or laid down for Kelly for a lot of those world titles, whatever it would have been, the first eight probably. There wasn't any legitimate competitor. Until Andy. And then Andy came in and Andy was brash and in his face and basically like saying to Kelly, I want to kill you. Yeah. I'm going to take what's mine and F you. And Kelly had never been confronted with that level of confrontation through his amateur rank years, through professional years. And so he never, he didn't know how to respond to it. The, con- the direct confrontation. And he was going through a bunch of other stuff at the time. He talked about being in an unhealthy relationship where the night before the pipe masters, where it was down to him and Andy, his girlfriend was like on the phone fighting with his mom. Like that's how unhealthy the relationship was. Imagine your girlfriend fighting with your own mom. I know, but I don't want to hear that, Kelly. It you, fe- feels like an excuse right there. It's what it does, uh, David it, Lee. It no, feels like an excuse. I don't think it was an excuse at all. It was all built into this greater context. It feels of, like a passive aggressive. This is why, I mean, I totally lost fair and square. Just the backstory. I was going through a lot of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. You should be a man and keep that stuff locked down, Kelly Slater. I think it's manly to except that, you know, that he had made decisions in his life. Like he was using Andy as actually, he was thanking Andy saying, Andy forced me to confront all of these things that I hadn't actually confronted. I was living in this unhealthy relationship. I had these unhealthy relationships in my family. I was paying for all my family stuff. Like, and through this confrontation, and that's by the way, the resolution was Andy made me be a better competitor. And he talked about um, Hicks and Gracie who he had admired and developed a relationship with had said, Hey Kelly, quit while you're on top. You have eight world titles, quit while you're on top. And then through confronting Andy and then kind of getting over it and becoming a better competitor due to Andy, he then got three more world titles and he then told Hicks and like, Hey, remember when you told me to quit? Well, now I've got 11 instead of eight. Sweet. You're, You're wrong. Sweet. You know, uh, the problem is, though, I'm going to go back to it. Andy was dealing with all kinds of stuff, too, right? I mean, I guess Kelly didn't take, I guess Kelly didn't even insinuate that his personal problems are what led him to lose to Andy Irons. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. Okay. He was acknowledging that he had a bunch of personal problems that made him a um, a feeble competitor, like a feeble-minded kind of, there was a hole in his game that Andy identified and capitalized on. Do you think peak Andy versus peak Kelly, mentally, physically, emotionally, who do you take? It's a great question. I mean, we could argue that we witnessed it and Andy came out on top. Obviously. But... That's what I have to argue. But no, but you said... Yeah, peak, peak, peak. Peak emotionally. Yep. And I think Kelly hit a peak emotionally after that, which was when Andy was hitting a slum. You know, Andy fell off tour, ultimately. And had to work. And so Kelly was winning during those years. And so 
I, I would put my money on Kelly. I'm Clearly, gonna, Kelly has 11 world titles for a reason. I'm going to put my money on Andy. I'm going to say peak on peak, Andy's the better surfer. It's really hard because you also have to view, the, we have the benefit of hindsight. And so Kelly, Andy's rawness was almost in response to Kelly's polish. Polish, totally. And it's hard to take context out of it and just go this versus that. Of it's course like it saying is. Well, I mean, Jordan it's, versus Kobe. Yeah. And it's, and it's, there's judging and all that too, but uh, totally. And who, who, which style appeals to which person, obviously surfing is a completely subjective game. There's no way to say one is better than the other. Yeah. But yeah. And so I guess subjectively. Well, 